Hey everyone, welcome to another Caternix Corner Live. I'm glad everyone could join us today. Looks like we've got a few people in the chat room, so that's great. Uh, with us today is none other than Perry Schofield, and he's going to bring us up to date on what he's been working on since the last time we saw him. Uh, welcome to the show, Perry. Thank you, and thank you for having me on, Terry. Absolutely, no problem. Um, guys, Perry is up in northern Canada where it is freezing cold. Um, so the internet may be a little bit glitchy. Hopefully we can get through it tonight, but um, just be patient and uh, kind of bear with us on this. But um, okay, as always, I do got a couple of announcements that I need to run through uh, before we get started. Um, big shout out to our channel supporters, um, Hatching Time and uh, Southwest Game Birds. Um, I no longer call them sponsors um, because that was kind of giving the impression that they were giving me stuff or giving me money for the channel. Um, they're basically channel supporters. They give me stuff, but it's all stuff that we give away on the channel. And I, I just wanted you guys to know that. Um, Hatching Time, uh, you can visit their website at hatchingtime.com. They also uh, gave us a $50 uh, gift certificate that can be used on their website, which will go to one lucky winner tonight. And Southwest Game Birds, you can get a 10% uh, discount on anything on their website if you use the uh, coupon code Caternix Corner. And Michael just talked to me a few minutes ago before we went live and said he is donating a 30 count of um, their mixed hatching eggs, uh, Breeder's Choice, I think he calls them, something like that, or Hatchery Choice. Hatchery Choice is what he calls them. So somebody's going to win uh, a 30 count of hatching eggs from Southwest Game Birds tonight. Um, let's see. Uh, also, we had a, uh, a little issue, not an issue, but a, uh, a post over on the Facebook group page. Um, we're giving away a Barato Cereal. It's made by Barato, but it's a Cereal humidity pump. Uh, that's $150 value. You're going to get a brand new humidity pump. We had a whole bunch of people um, comment on that uh, post, and we have selected... Um, a winner, but you do have to be in the chat tonight to win that. Uh, when we announce the winner, I need you to, you know, verify that you're here in the chat. Uh, if we don't get a, you know, a response from you, we're going to move on to the next winner. So uh, make sure you listen uh, for your name to be called for that. And uh, somebody's going to win a uh, Cereal Humidity Pump. Also, we have our, uh, our continuing series on Caternix uh, Quail Color Genetics, which is hosted by Allie of Maine's Confetti Quail Farm. 
uh, episodes are streamed live over on Facebook and then reposted here on the Caternix Corner YouTube channel in one of our, uh, our um, um, what do they call those things, playlist? Yeah, that's it. I'll get it, guys. Um, but Allie does a really good job of explaining, you know, the, the uh, different mutations. She uses visuals and whatnot um, and terminology, uh, and she explains that terminology so even the beginner can follow along. Also, I want to announce, we did a, uh, um, a live stream from my quail room a few weeks back. And then I also did a, another live stream last week, I believe it was, um, from my quail room. So I think what we're going to do now, we're going to do a, this is kind of a test thing going on, but I'm going to continue to do the uh, uh, Caternix Corner Live uh, from my computer room, which is where I'm at now. Uh, but we're going to select a day of the week. And I'm going to try to do a, a live stream from the shop. And we're going to call that Shop Talk. And that's basically going to be one hour of, you know, just basically talking about what's going on in the quail room. Uh, if anybody's got questions, you guys could be, you know, talking back and forth in the chat room. Um, just uh, something a little bit different. And the thing that's going to be nice about it is I can move around when I'm out in the shop, I've got a camera that I can uh, move around with so I can walk over, you know, show you what's in the cages or show, you know, feeders, cage design, stuff like that. So um, we're going to give that a try, see how it works out. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can get a second live stream going. Um, next week on the 25th, Naomi from uh, Kansas City Quail is going to be here. Um, she's got some really important announcements that she wants to make. So you guys mark your calendars, the 25th. Um, Naomi will be here. I want to give a shout out to our moderators, uh, Lauren and Henriette. I think I've seen both of you guys in here so far tonight. So I appreciate that. All right. I think I've talked enough. Perry, um, if you're ready, uh, let's go ahead and get this thing started. Why don't you start out by telling us a little bit about yourself and then we'll jump right into the slideshow. Just let me know when you want me to bring it up. Okay. Well, I'm 67 years old. I'm a retired teacher. I taught school for 38 years, mostly junior high, and I survived. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, sometimes with junior highs. I grew up on a dairy farm in Nova Scotia. I started raising birds when I was 10 years old. I saw my first Coternic Quail in 1978. Okay. So uh, I moved. Uh, to Alberta, Northern Canada, in 1980, and then I had some Coternix, but my real start with Coternix came in 1986. I had moved to a new school where I was teaching junior high science, and I got in touch with the University of BC, who had a facility called the Quail Facility at that time. They wouldn't sell eggs to the regular person, but since I was a teacher, I was able to get eggs to hatch in my classroom. Mm -hmm. So 1986 was the start of the Schofield Silver Collection. At that time, I got the Silvers, Ferrells, Rosetta's, Tuxedo's, English Whites, not Texas A&M Whites, but English Whites from them, and also the Rosetta had the gene for the Celadon gene, the blue egg. And I had a, a line of fell, uh, the wild color quail, that laid a snow white egg. It wasn't wow. Celadon. When you broke it open, the cell was white. A lot of people now are getting Celadon eggs, which are very light in color. But when you break them open, they still have that blue tinge inside. The white eggs I had were white, just like a Bob White egg. Hmm. And if anybody knows where there are some that lays a white egg, I would love to know. I always <laughs> regret it not being able to keep it going. So that's a little history. Oh, I wanted to mention, so this September will be 36 years since I got the eggs from the University of BC. So mm -hmm. I've kept my silver line going for 36 years. Wow. I got the eggs mid September and they hatched the first week of October. 
a little more history on the Schofield service. It was in 19, yeah, 1914 that I did the, the trade with Robbie Richard of James Marie Farms, and he uh, got the eggs for me to bring the silvers in uh, mm -hmm. Sheldon eggs into the U.S. And it was in 2015, I think in April, was when he first released the eggs to sell for the public. Mm -hmm. So all the silvers you see in the U.S. in the Sheldon egg layers, as far as I know, came from that importation by Robbie in 2014. Wow, that's great. Yeah, and I get <laughs> I, I get called I I don't know we did it legal everything we did was totally because Robbie has a professional quail farm everything had to be done right so every paper was signed and darted but since that time I've got calls from people in Germany England uh, Norway Sweden Malta all people who now have the Schofield Silver Collection. So I'm not quite sure how they got everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad it's it's hap it's a good thing. I love the color. So, uh, well, well, Terry, you it. had a couple of slides for me. We could go through quickly. Absolutely. Let me make sure I'm on the first one. Yeah, we are. Okay. Uh, about two and a half years ago, because of my knees, I had to get rid of every thing I had. So all my cages, I sold my egg leads, all my birds, but I was able to get a close friend to keep some for me to keep my lines going. So when I came back, I had to start new cages. So I make all these cages. They're 48 inches wide, uh, 18 inches deep, 10 inches at the back, 11 and a half inches at the front, so the mm -hmm. eggs roll out. Okay. Because I didn't know how long I was going to be in it again, I bought really heavy-duty shelf frames from Home Depot because I figured if I only kept them for a year or two, at least I could use the shelves to store to as uh, shelves again. So <laughs> right. <laughs> these frames are never going to break down. The wire is one and a half is one inch times half inch black sixteen gauge coated wire. So when I want to, it's pretty, and it's coated really good from Home Depot up in Canada. I take them out when I want to wash them, just take my power washer and they wash up really nice. Nice. The boxes uh, I make, and then they're coated with Verithane, a clear Verithane, two okay. coats. So they're real easy when I go to clean them out. And nothing sticks to them, they don't get moldy or anything. So if you want to go on to the second frame. Absolutely. This is some more cages. Uh, cages are made at 48 inches wide, but each cage has a, a div two dividers inside. I can drop down and it makes into three 16 by 18 cages, which I can use as a hospital cage, or if mm -hmm. I want to do some selective breeding of which I'm doing on a couple cages later. If I want to put a male and two or three hints, very special in one pin, I can select from them. Otherwise, I usually want 12 to 15 hints and three males in a cage. Okay, next slide. Okay, I was very lucky to get the first bracks in Canada. So any bracks in Canada outside of maybe one price, I think, are coming from the stock I was able to get. Very good person gave me some eggs and I hatched three. What I'm doing right now is I want to introduce new blood into the black because I started with three birds. Over the years, for the, for the last 36 years, anytime I wanted to put new blood into a color, I always went back to the original Quaternic Quail. I always breed back to the wild type. So right now I have my biggest black male who I'm really pleased with. He comes in almost 300 grams, which is just about 12 ounces, which is a good size black. I got him in with three of my wild type 
birds, I wanted to introduce the jumbo gene I have into the blacks. Also, one of these ones uh, lays the blue celadon eggs. So hopefully, I'm going to be able to introduce the jumbo gene and the celadon gene into the black my black line. And eventually, I will be able to have jumbo blacks laying celadon eggs. Mm, nice. So that's probably a project for, uh, probably take me five generations. The birds in with him right now are what we call 360 grams and larger. 360 grams is about 12 and three quarter ounces. The biggest one in there, which lays the blue egg, is about 14 and a half ounces American. Okay. So good sized birds. So that's going to mm. make my blacks get bigger. So if you want to move on to the next one, Terry. Yep. Now, I still like to pray with my sobers. In the years I've had the sobers, I've probably had 10 or different color correlations where I've tried to bread them different silver colors, darker silver colors. Right now, I'm kind of working on a calico silver just to see if I can make it. And I said, okay, what will silver gene do when I put it with the black? So I have a, there's three birds in there with him. One is what, two of them are kind of calico. The big bird in front, they're all jumbos again because I want to get the jumbo size. Mm -hmm. The big bird in front is about a, almost a 15 ounce bird. The other ones are 13 and a half ounce. And uh, the one on the right hand is what I call a charcoal. I make charcoals by taking a, a nice silver male and breeding him to a dark Tibetan hen. Hmm. About one out of every five or six chicks for me will come out a really, really dark gray. Not black, but dark gray. And I've always called that color charcoal. So he's in with... Uh, or one with a little more white, then there's one in the background you can't see that is more uh, of the calico gray, and then with a charcoal. I will take those chicks from him, from that pin, and I will breed those chicks back to each other. And then I'll take a couple hints and breed back to him and see if I can darken my gray color or if, I, if the gray will make the black get even more black. Okay, you can go to the next one. This is my one of my calico birds. You know, she's dark gray with white. Not quite what I'm looking for right now, but she's getting close. And again, it's a jumbo, about 13 ounces. She's okay. the one you couldn't see in the back of the pen with the black male. Right. You can go over. This is the charcoal bird. It's not black. You can see it's kind of a, a dark gray. Mm -hmm. And it's not a good one. I've had much, much nicer in the past. It was it, <laughs> it was in my pen with the, all my hens to sell, so it got a little <laughs> chewed upon. <laughs> okay, and I think there's maybe one more, two more pins. Here's some of my bracks in the pen, young bracks. These guys are just starting to lay. I'm going to be selling black eggs starting in probably a couple of weeks here in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, there's 12 hens in this 48-inch pin and three males right now. Wow. And you want to move on? Not a good picture, but this is pansies. Again, My favorite. Yeah. These are not actually, I sold my pansies when I sold out to another guy and he kind of went in a different direction. So I'm trying to move these back. The pansies I like has have a more cream body. Like these have a more gold base. The ones I had had a cream base, almost a, a light, almost a cream color, light gold underneath mm -hmm. the spots in my, my uh, patches on them were much more patches than uh, spots than they were these ones. But I'm working on it. It's 
<laughs> that's the fun about contouring. You can get so many generations so fast. You can <laughs> right work on it. Okay, next picture. And then this is a pin up in the back. Uh, in the top, you can see the one divider is down. And there's a couple hints in there. I'm checking to see the Celadon color I have is in all my colors except for the black. And, and I'm trying to put that in right now. So there's a, there's a couple of hints in there, pansy hints. Then the pansies, a doctor pin. I had two that were getting picked on in the middle. Down below is a, is a group of hints for sale, all different colors. And I've probably got 10 small ones. The minimum weight I keep is about 270 for a hen. The mm -hmm. minimum at uh, 270 grams for a hen. For uh, to be a jumble, they got to be a minimum Canadian 300 grams. What I'm hoping to do in the next year or two is have every hen I have in every cow be the minimum jumble weight. But I was almost there when I sold out two and a half years ago. But it's it's coming. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it. Cool. Perry, you got a, a light in there? It looks you yeah, got awful it's, dark. It's only ten it's only five cranny here. The sun <laughs> went this went down. The sun's gone. <laughs> there you go. I, I was thinking that. maybe it was you. I, I never even looked at yeah, the sun's gone down here about ten after five. Yeah. Right now it's minus twenty six Celsius outside. And tonight wow. we're supposed to go down to at least minus thirty Celsius. Which wow. is close to minus I think it's close to minus thirty Fahrenheit or minus twenty five Fahrenheit. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Yeah, for you guys who don't yeah. notice I'm wearing a jacket tonight. Uh sitting in my computer room I have to wear a jacket. It's it's so cold. Yeah, and he's talking about 55 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> That's what it is. <clears throat> That's cold to me. And I don't have a heater in my house, so I have to deal with it. Um, yeah. Okay, Perry, if you're ready, we can go ahead and jump right into the questions. Um, uh, I'm ready. See what these guys have for us. Hold on one second. Let me get back up to the top. Um, Sunrise River Coils in the house says, I can't wait. Thinks the drawing is tonight. That is absolutely correct. Uh, Junie's in the house says, uh, hey, folks, I'm shivering and trying to get over the Rona, but I'm not missing this. Ooh, I hope you feel better. <laughs> I hope so, too. Yeah. Gary says, hello to all from Spring Ranch, Nebraska. Really like the silvers. Can't wait to hear more about them. Um, let's see, our Lauren's in the house. She's one of our moderators. Uh, good evening for all from Chile, Pennsylvania. Bags of Love's in the house. Good evening all from North Carolina. And here's one from up in your neck of the woods. Danny Redden says hello from, hello and good evening from Nova Scotia, Canada. Yeah, I grew up in Nova Scotia. He actually, if I remember... He's not, he, uh, Redden is not very far from where I grew up on a dairy farm. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, we got Richard in the house checking in from Parkland County, Alberta. Yep, down around the Edmonton area. Okay. Shane Thomas says, howdy from Mars Hill, North Carolina. Hello and welcome. Bird Dog Quail Farm says, hello from Nashville, Tennessee. Here's our other moderator, Henriette Bullion. She says, hello, everyone. Hope everyone is doing great tonight. Hope you guys are doing good over there in South Africa. Uh, Kathy says, looking forward to this uh, from under a foot of snow in Ontario, Canada. <laughs> They're cold, too, right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I see I read that one. Victoria says, hello, from Western Maryland. Okay, Richard's got a question for you. Uh, would like access to some hatching eggs near Edmonton. Please let me know how I can get a hold of breeders. Thanks. Can you help them out with that, Perry? Well, <laughs> I I actually live four and a half hours north of Edmonton. My son lives three hours south of Edmonton. And about every four to five weeks, I drive from my place down to see my son in Calgary mm -hmm. and my little three-year-old granddaughter <laughs> so 
if he gets in touch with me, we can arrange, if he'll meet me on the main highway, sometimes before COVID, I'd start out with 30 boxes in my car. Wow. To deliver by the time I got to Calgary. <laughs> <laughs> Eggs, chicks, birds. Uh, I, I've gone down, I went to an auction one time in Red there, which is halfway between, almost halfway between Edmonton and Calgary. Mm -hmm. I took 42 boxes with me and I had 10 left to put in the auction. <laughs> oh no. Wow. So I, I do a lot of delivery. I, I ship eggs all across Canada. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you ship eggs, the fertility suffers. Right. I don't, I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. care. I, I tell people, I buy eggs myself. And if I get 25% on my chicken eggs, I'm happy. Because mm -hmm. I don't buy eggs unless I want something really bad. Or right. I want, need new blood. Yep. You know, well, there you go, Richard. Perry can hook you up. Yeah, if he emails me, mm -hmm. it, actually, I was on uh, Alberta Chicken, etc. If he goes on there and find me, okay. I w I'm taking orders right now for eggs to start shipping in February. Okay, perfect. Okay, Michael says hello, everyone, from Georgia. Xavier3520 says hello from South Texas. Hello and welcome. Oh, he's also saying 74 today, nice and breezy. <laughs> Jeez, I wish it was. Okay. Richard says minus 22 Celsius in Alberta. Yeah. Shane Thomas says, got to love the mountains of North Carolina. 11 degrees yesterday, 52 today. Yep. Jesse Mills is in the house, says good evening, everyone. Freedom Quail Farm says hello. Uh, Klaus is joining us from the Netherlands. Hello, everyone. Welcome, Klaus. Glad you can make it tonight. Uh, La Sierra Acres Hatchery says, hey, everyone. Pam Gomez says, hi. Uh, El Hornack says, hello from Corbeil, Ontario. Yeah, well, I hours. think I've, I may have set that person eggs. I'm not, I've shipped, okay. like I said, all over Canada. Did I say that name right, Corbeil? I think so. Uh, Jeff Hardy says, hi from Ohio. What age do the quail need to be to put on the half inch by one inch coated wire floor? What, yeah, what do you use in your cages, Barry, for the floors? Uh, for the, for the, when they first hatch, I have half inch by half inch. Mm -hmm. By the time, by the time they're three to four weeks old, they actually do okay on the inch by half inch. Yep. So yep, that's about the same that, that I do. I, I like to I like to keep them on the half inch for the first three weeks. Right. And actually, for the first week, we often put paper down on the half inch mm -hmm. because I find that the small guys will be picking up food and waste a lot of it. Right. <laughs> and I find if that first four or five days they, before they get even the half inch, they get that. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. All right, Nick says hello, everyone, coming in from Evans, Colorado. Hope you're all having a wonderful evening. Thanks, Nick, and welcome. Uh, Belinda says brains of North Carolina. Okay. <laughs> uh, Dale's in the house says good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dale. Michael Eddy says hello from Ohio. Uh, Glenn Wells says calling CQ says howdy from N0GCW. Welcome to the uh, show, Glenn. Glad you can make it. Is that N N O G? I'm not sure where that is. Uh, N zero. Um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, they didn't know. I don't think they they use the designators anymore um, in the states here. Um, as a matter of fact, I just got a new call sign. Probably about six months ago, uh, my father died, and he's been a ham since he was a teenager. Uh, so I uh, I got his call sign just to carry it on. Trucker Planet says, good evening, Terry. How are you? I'm great. Hello from Westfield, Massachusetts. Glad you could make it. Um, let's see. Southern Lady Z says, hello from, oh, Southern Ladies. Hello from uh, Anaheim, California. Harley Gamebird's in the house. Uh, hello, everyone. CNC Bluebird says howdy from far west Texas. Junie says hello, Mr. Perry. 
Sunrise River Coil says, hello, Perry and Terry. Uh, it's so wonderful to see you are doing well. Andrea says, hello to both of you. Uh, Go Big 007 says, I love you for bringing Celadon into the USA for us. Uh, we have raised them for the past year now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Perry. Uh, Danny Redden says, hello, Terry and Perry from Wolfsville, Nova Scotia, home of the Acadia University. Katie, that's my hometown. I grew up seven miles from there. I'll Wolfsville. be darned. Small and world, isn't it? Acadia University. Yeah, small world. Uh, Better home waking, Homemaking Network says, greetings. Jeff Martin says, hey, from Nebraska. A. Jones says, hi, Terry and Perry, checking in from the northeast tip of Ohio. Thanks for doing the show. Absolutely, and thanks for showing up. Yep, Nick says, the legend. That's you, Perry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Carol Ray says, hello, from Florida. Gary Miller says, uh, hello, from North Carolina. La Sierra Acres Hatchery says, Hey, Perry, love the silver collection. They are our most popular quail we sell here in Southern California. Cool. Donna says, uh, Hello from Brit British Columbia, Canada. Yeah, um, she's actually, I'm sending her some eggs this spring and some chicken eggs. Oh, cool. I, believe her. I also uh, raise heritage birds. Okay. Christian's here from Montreal. Welcome. Ava Fisher says, question, Perry, how long did it take you to make the uh, Schofield Silver Collection until they were ready to be released publicly? Okay. The first silvers I got were what I called a phase one silver. When they came from the UBC 36 years ago, what they did, they would not cross breed the silvers together because there was so much, so much death in the eggs and the, the babies. So what they did, they only crossed a silver with a wild type. And what you got from that first cross was a wild type bird that looked wild, but it was a gray color. It had exactly the same markings as a wild bird, but it was a very light gray. Hmm. So those were the first silvers I ever had, what I called a phase one. Because I had such a small operation, like when I first got them, I was only keeping like six hens of each of the six colors, and I didn't have a very big space. I only had a little 10 by 10 building, and, and I also had uh, three other types of quail. I had Bruce Gale and California and Gamos at the same time, so there wasn't. Mm -hmm. So they said, don't cross sobers to sobers, so I said, well, okay. Maybe I'll cross them out to something else. So I started crossing out to Rosetta's and to Tibetans. And at that time, those were two of the six main colors. When I first got the Sobers, I had never seen any more than six colors I could ever find. Mm -hmm. I actually got some eggs from Mars Farms in California at the time. They were the people who made uh, the Rolex incubator and the Turnix. Okay. So the silver color you see right now didn't come till about the fourth year I had them. And that was after I crossed out a couple of times to Rosetta's, crossed back to the, to the wild type. And, and then I started to get what I call a true silver. It was a really, every now and then you'll see somebody put a picture of a really nice medium grade bird. Mm -hmm. with no other hardly any markings. I called those true sobers. And once I started getting those, the sober colors you see today take off, took off. So mm -hmm. it would probably be three years before I got those. Mm -hmm. And that was, by that time too, the death rate had gone down from, well, the university said 50% of the eggs will be infertile if you breed sober to sober. 25% right. of the eggs will die when you put them in the incubator. They'll form, but they'll die. And if you were lucky, 25% of the eggs might hatch, but some of those would die. Like when oh. I got it, the lethal gene was really lethal in them. 
Hmm. And that, it, 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 by the third year, I had it down, so I was getting maybe 60 to 70 percent of the eggs were so infertile. They, they were still affecting it. And out of the 60 or 70 percent, I was getting close to 60 percent live chicks. Right. But during those three or four years, I probably did eight generations. Wow. Nice. I've always been intrigued by the Caternic Quails, how many generations you can get. Right. So one year, I, I had them in the basement in a house in northern Alberta at the time. <laughs> I decided I'm going to see how many generations I could get in one year. So from January 1st, when I set the eggs, to January 10th of the next year, I actually hatched six generations. Wow. And had one laying. So as soon as the bird at six weeks, six and a half week was laying, I take the first week of eggs, toss them in the incubator, <laughs> and hatch them. Wow. So I had the great, 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 great grandmother, and maybe there was one more great in there, on one end, <laughs> and the other end, the hen started right. to lay. Wow. That's crazy. So I, it's amazing to realize because occasionally I also had one hen that laid up. Five weeks of age, which helped. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Vasil says, uh, Vas Vasil, I hope I said that right. Hello from Georgia. George says, hey there, everyone. I learned a lot from the chats. Glad to uh, have you here. Uh, Pam Gomez says, hi from Perry, Florida. Oh, okay. Yep. <laughs> uh, Nick says, uh, question, how do you isolate your celadons to ensure they're celadon carriers only, and how do you know if your rooster is a celadon carrier? Are there specific color mutations that are carriers? Okay, I have found over the years that the Rosetta in Tibetans will carry the celadon or, or mind it more often than other colors. I, I have find I have found that if you get the gene into a nice Tibetan, which is the dark the dark brown, what I call the old fashioned Tibetan, uh, it seems to do better. Now the celadon gene, because I over the years I had nobody else to trade with to keep the colors going, I had to breed out colors to colors and breed bat all the time. This I just use basic Mendo principles for genetics. I'm not a genetic guy, I don't plan. But I had celadon eggs coming from every color of bird you could see. You, you name the color and I've got celadon eggs from them. Mm -hmm. But I do find if you want to be the line, just make it true. I believe that the Tibetan or Rosetta will do it better than any other color. Okay. What I do, and I'm probably going to make some people mad with this, when I, when I hatch chicks from blue eggs, I take them and I nipped off on the back left leg. I just take the tip of their hind toe mm -hmm. off. So I absolutely cannot mix them up with any other birds. And those birds, if you breed together, from that hatch, then you will increase your percentage of celadons. I now see there's people in the U.S., and I, did you say it maybe, that are getting 100% celadon eggs? Um, I don't know. I don't deal with the celadons at all. Yeah, I, I never did. If I was mm -hmm. lucky, I found if you bred too often for celadon, you started to get problems. I found on the third or fourth generation, mm -hmm. my birds would get a little bit smaller, and yep. they seem to be more delicate. Really, you know, it's they funny you say that because we had a guest like, on. We had a guest on not too long ago, um, Klaus from the Netherlands, uh, and that's exactly what he was talking about: was you know issues with uh, multiple generation celadons. I I found that years ago. I, you know, I might do three or four generations of celadon, never more than four, and I'd be getting maybe 60% of the chicks, over half would come celadon. Right. But then I would cross out. 
I tried going a little farther a couple of times, and I found fertility went down. Even though I was hatching from jumbo birds, the chicks were smaller, and they just didn't yep. seem to be as happy. You know, I know a couple of people have called and knocked me about that, and they've said they've actually, they're going to switch because they did Saladon generation so long. Mm -hmm. They're going to switch and do no Saladons because their line actually petered oak. Right. The birds yeah, were just we not happy. Yep. Good to know. Okay, Robert says, good evening from Minnesota. Uh, all right, Del Chuchu's in the house. Uh, hello, everyone. Greetings from Cuba. Um, and tell that daughter of yours, I said, happy birthday. There's somebody in Cuba that's, no, it's no maybe it's Brazil. There's somebody in Brazil mm -hmm. that has the coternix that lay white eggs. Oh, Not really? Not settled on eggs, but white eggs. I'll be I've hard. contracted him a couple of times, but never got an answer. Right. <laughs> Isn't that the way it goes? Yeah. Uh, Gary Miller says, awesome, Terry. Can't wait. Uh, oh, he's talking about the Shop Talk uh, live streams. Jeff Martin says, Shop Talk sounds great. I've gained a lot from your videos. Uh, Del Chuchu says, Perry, I remember from the last live that you mentioned different types of quails. Um, hold on. I don't know if he's got. Um, have you ever seen a naked neck quail or other types? Yes. When I first bought the birds from UBC, now UBC being a university, they have mm -hmm. students who would go through two or three generations at a time. They actually had naked neck coturnix. Really? They had coturnix with one blue eye and one other color eye. <laughs> they had uh, uh, frizzles. Right. Uh, at the time, they had 30 different, when, when I bought the eggs, they had mm -hmm. 30 different types of quail I could pick from. Wow. Now, some, some of them would be like the naked nakes were in the wild type, and they were in the rosettas. They had two colors of naked nakes. They had frizzles in uh, the wild type, in golden, and in white. Mm-hmm. And, and by frizzles, they, I, I used to have pictures. They were really, the feathers were really curled. Really? Uh, I have hatched uh, Coturnix, and I could never get it to be true, a white bird with a black head. I'm not talking about a black spot on the head. I'm talking right. about the whole head wow. and neck partway down being black with wow. a black head. You know, that would be cool. Of course, that's from crossing everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's another good question. Uh, Junie says, Perry, your last talk you spoke about how you had uh, blue eggs the color of Robin's eggs. How did you manage to get them that color? Um, I can only get pale blue. Okay, before I sold my birds two years ago, I had been working with my uh, Saladons. And I had a couple of hens that were, were laying a really, really nice blue egg. So I started separating, oh, and only for three generations, I only bred those birds. Mm -hmm. And I breed about 20 hens of each color in each generation. And I picked only the brightest and darkest blue with no spots. Yeah. I, when I, I like a salad on egg that has no spots on it. Mm -hmm. I don't like the pale blue ones as much. So I did selection, and I was using to get the darker blue. Again, I was using the Rosetta Tibetans. Okay. Because I don't know whether it, it's maybe because they're a darker bird and has already have that darker color in them, but I right. would get the darkest eggs from them. I had really nice saladons. I had a couple of hints their mm -hmm. eggs were. You put a robin egg by it. And it was a shade less, but it was pretty close. <laughs> cool. Yeah. But that, All again, right, Xavier that says, takes farm. go ahead. Uh, Xavier yeah. says, awesome. First time here, but loving all these quail streams. Um, Robert says, I had my first Coturnix back in the early 70s. Uh, not many colors available at that time. Yeah. It, I, I, I got mine in the 70s, the first one in 78. Did you? At that time... You could only get English whites. You could get uh, what they called Monterian 
Manchurian Golden. They didn't mm. even talk about Italian Goldens at that time. Right. And the Manchurians did not breed true. Hmm. If you bred Manchurians to Manchurians, you'd get a certain percentage of wild color. About really? 70% Manchurian. They had the Rosetta. They had the Tibetan. They had the ta dark tuxedos, which were from Tibetan bears. And why? There were six colors. And I right. never, until I got a hold of the university, didn't know that there was all these different colors. Right. And I know in the U.S. when I was looking for eggs at that time, basically I was I even bought some eggs in one time from the U.S. back in the 80s. You never seen anybody advertising all these different colors. Right. Right. Uh, have when did you when did you see uh, start seeing colors? You've been in it for a while. When did you start seeing colors for the first time? All these odd colors shown. Who me? Yeah. No, I I haven't been in it that long. I'm I'm only on my third year of breeding quail. Oh, okay. And I, I'm I'm, I'm right now just starting to learn all the all the colors. Uh, that's why I'm getting into the genetic side of it. You know, to yeah. get a better understanding of the colors. See, I until and I have to say I I said this was really because of Robbie. Robbie had collected some colors. He he raises thousands at that time, so he didn't right. have many cases. But I never seen the explosion in colors in the U.S. until Robbie released the Sobers. Right. And I think, and I found with the Sobers over the year, you never knew sometimes what mutation or what color you would get when you bred a Sober with another color. Never right. always the same. Like Sobers with my Goldens one year, I actually had Sober Goldens with the exact marking of an Italian Golden, but a really? bright Sober body. Wow. The next time I bred them, I got this funny looking bird, which I, ne I got six or seven. I never even kept them. They, they were not the same. <laughs> so I, I blame a lot of these colors upon the sober gene being introduced and then people selected. People who like mm. coternics, they say, oh, I like that color. I'm going to breed it and make it true. Right. You yep. know, there's so many hobbyists over the U.S now sure yeah there is they find a new color and colors new colors will crop up all the time in them yep. since that gene and i think that's why you've seen such an explosion in colors yeah i'm hearing of colors that i've never even heard of before oh uh, all the time i see them uh yeah. you never know what the color really is there's so many names <laughs> right because every comes up with their own name <laughs> I actually, uh, this, I actually, here, this might be interesting to you, Perry. Uh, Henriette says we sometimes get pure white eggs uh, with no blue in it. But she's in South Africa. I don't think you'll get any from her. <laughs> no. See, to be, to be honest, that white gene is probably buried someplace deeply in mm. my silvers. Right. The Saladon egg, I actually lost it for 10 years. Wow. Well, like, again, with a small flock mm -hmm. and crossing out and back to keep genetics so they actually, whoops, I'm going to pick, so, to keep yep. genetics so they'd breed, it was gone. So I sold some Rosetta birds to a friend of mine in BC. And he phoned up and he said, I have a bird that's laying a blue egg. Do you want it? <laughs> I drove, I drove five hours to pick it up one wow. night. Wow. That's crazy. And that and that was probably four or five years before Robbie got them from me. Right. But it had been gone for quite a while. Okay. All right. Uh, let me uh, get going. I don't, I'm hoping that we're not, uh, you're starting to glitch a little bit uh, image-wise. Audio is still good, but uh, we're glitching. Uh Nick says, wow, congratulations on the 36-year legacy you've continued. Um, La Sierra Acres says, some of the silvers I've hatched from my shire have blue inside the eggs. They should. When I sold the silvers to the U.S., that gene was there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Kim says, hi, y'all from Montana. What are the most notable traits of the Schofield collection you are speaking of? Notable, notable traits, Mary. Okay, uh, one thing, 
don't breed them more than seven generations. <laughs> <laughs> if you do that, I find that the seven that the deadly gene will start to appear again. No problems with four or five or six, but I, I suggest to everybody, if you're breeding sobers to get the sober color after six generations, I cross back out to the wild type. Right. This to keep them, them alive. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, sobers are very gentle. I found the sobers are a little more quiet than some of the other strains. I found English whites were always more nervous. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, William Carl Foster says, enjoy seeing the new varieties in Canada. I think that's where you got your blacks from, wasn't it? That's where my blacks came from. Okay. Uh, Belinda says she likes your cages. Um, I make them to sell. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, CRC says, hello, question. How many generations uh, would you recommend to bring new blood and why? Saladons. I wouldn't go past much past four generations. Sobers. Okay. I bred sobers to get, to get certain colors of sobers up to seven, seven generations. I started to have problems. So five or six on sobers. You can cross oak to a wild type bird, not related mm -hmm. to your flock. Always do that. Get, if you're going to do a cross oak, when I do a cross oak for new blood, I find somebody, do research on them, try to make sure they've been at least four or five years that they haven't got birds from me, <laughs> which at one time was pretty hard in Canada because now there's, there's a lot more breeders in Canada than there used to be. So you get unrelated wild type bird, cross them out to the, take the chicks. You may not have that color, but when you breed those chicks back together, 25% of the birds should be the color you're looking for. And now you got your new blood in it. All right. And whenever I could, I would get two. If I could, I'd get two strains of wild type birds. Mm -hmm. I would breed my sober males to the wild type hen. And I would breed the best wild type male I could get from a different line to my sober hens. Okay. So actually, when I bred them back together, there would be three bloodlines in my line was ready to go again and stay healthy. Right. Okay. Um, we are pushing almost 8 o'clock, so I'm going to just just read off the questions from here on out um, and kind of skip over just the general comments. So CNC Bluebird says, a question, what is the best quail to start with in the desert? Um, we do get some snow. People may not believe it. Coturnics are the toughest quail I've ever raised. Mm -hmm. I think so too. I've yep. had them in 40 below, no water yep. for three months, lots of straw in the pen, and they survived with absolutely no water, just snow to eat. Wow. That's cool. Uh, Ava says, what was the result of the uh, black cross to a pharaoh? Did it reduce the color or what effects did you find that it had on the blacks? Don't know. I'm just doing it. <laughs> oh, you're just not I, doing it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm expecting the black color to disappear probably in the first generation. So what I will do is I will take those chicks and breed together. And I will take the black male I have and breed mm -hmm. to two or three of the hens from that half. So I'm going to breed brother to sister because normally that will guarantee you at least 25% of the color. It works right. in most colors, not all, but generally that works. But again, I've never done it with the black, so I'm not sure. That's this basic Mendel right. genetics, right? But then okay, I will take the black male, or I'll take his brother probably, right. the, the different nuts, and breed him to two or three hens. I expect there will be no or very little black in the hat. But it also could turn out to look like when the first generation of sobers. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of wondering if I might get some that looks like a, a, a feral bird with a grayer color on it. Right. Blacks. I'm hoping the sober to black is going to deepen the black color when I get that cross done. Right. Cool. 
Okay, Victoria says, question, if you had to name one vital reference source that quail keepers should have, what would that be? Right now, yeah. the internet and sites like yours. Yeah, I'd definitely say the this, internet. There's so much I information started, out there. When I started, I could have used so, these sites so often. I still, especially on the genetic side, because like I said, mm -hmm. I never worried about genetics. This basic, there's right. so much stuff on genetics now. I yep. will say this though. If you're, if you're going to keep quail, only keep them if you like them. Don't go into plan on making a fortune on them. Mm -hmm. They're fun. They're, I still love the hatching babies, you know. But have fun doing it. Don't get yeah. so tied up in doing one color or breeding one type because you're going to find after a couple of generations you're going to have problems. Do mm -hmm. it for the fun of it. Enjoy it. If you do something good, you get something nice that you can make your own, do it. But don't keep them if you're not having fun. Exactly. I agree 100% with that. Okay, Ava says, is the black different than the Tibetan and Rosetta and Grau? I see people say it's the same and some say that it's different. The blacks I got from Foster are different. Mm -hmm. Now, some of them are more gray. I got, they're more darker gray. Uh, I have got a couple really nice, almost black. Black is maybe... When people hear black, they think everything's going to be totally black. It's not. They are totally different than my... The Rosetta is uh, like a reddish brown. Mm -hmm. Just a basic comment. And the Tibetans are a much darker brown. But if, if I put the three in a pin, there's no problem telling the difference between them. Right. If you have a clear black. No problem at all. Okay. Okay, Freedom Quail Farm says, what is the best way to guide your quail to become jumbos? I have different colors in together, but would love to get them bigger. Weigh your breeders and weigh your eggs. Okay. Every, every hen I hatch before it goes into a pen, I weigh. Okay. Uh, kind of worldwide, I guess it's considered that 300 grams is a jumbo bird. It's the start of a hen being a jumbo. So that 300 grams is uh, around 11 and a half, 12 ounces for you guys. So mm -hmm. I weigh my birds. Nothing goes into my breeding pin that's not weighed. And if you want to get good jumbo, start laying your eggs. So once you've got your weight in your pin, start selecting your egg size. Um, I, <laughs> I'm half metric and half... Uh, American, okay, in my scales. When I weigh my eggs, I weigh them in ounces. I, I don't <laughs> pour any egg into my incubator for my own hatching that doesn't weigh at least 14 grams, and I think that's all oh, big. I forget how many ounces, but you can convert it. It's right. 14 grams. I had, my, I had the right, right in here to give you the ounces, and I don't have it. But I weigh my eggs. If you put small eggs, you're going to get small birds. Hmm. So you want, a, you want a good size egg. And I have eggs that come close to that measure, like 30. They don't go in. You know? I have birds that weighed, uh, well, I started with 14, and now they're up to 16, 17 average from the pen. Mm -hmm. And those birds are all producing like, 80% jumbles. Wow. Eggs from jumbo quail caternics, and people don't understand it, doesn't guarantee you're going to get jumbo chips. Right. A percentage of them will not reach that weight. Um, buying eggs from a good breeder will give you a better chance of getting jumbles. Yep. yep. The first three weeks, what you feed them will make a difference can make at least 30 grams difference. Like one, It can make a difference one-tenth of the weight, how you feed your birds in the first three weeks. All my feed is ground up. I, I, I feed uh, chick uh, crumble. Mm -hmm. I can't get game bird feed up here, so I feed 25%. Everything is ground up in a blender for the first two and a half, three weeks. Okay. 
that makes that can make like I said 30 grams difference I know people that feed this straight chick crumble they can eat it but I don't think they can digest it as good so I grind everything up for the first three weeks right I weigh all my birds and once I get my pen set up I weigh the eggs okay uh, infection prevent. Oh, infection prevention says love the silver collection. I've read that it's best to introduce genetics from other lines occasionally to keep the birds strong. Is a particular type recommended to maintain both size and color? Jumbo wild type. The yeah. jumbo fails. Okay. It's the original color. You can never go wrong to go yep. back to the old standby. Go back to the pharaohs. Freedom Quail Farm says, I have one pied gray and white tuxedo hen. Do you know how we could create more with their hatches? Okay, I've done that too. Breed it to a feral. Then take one of her take one of her males hatched and breed it back to her. If you work at it in two or three generations, you can get more of that. Mm-hmm. Again, Okay, Amanda members. says, sorry about that, Perry. Uh, Amanda says, would crossing a, a jumbo feral with a celadon help to make the celadons more stable and correct some of the issues? Yes, that's what I do. Like I said, every fourth generation I cross my celadons. My, my okay. celadon pin has eight colors in it. But every now and then, I try to keep a male that hats from celadon eggs in the pin mm -hmm. because that will give whoever buy the eggs more celadon. But I do not guarantee that every chick you hatch is going to be a celadon. I'm right. not interested in going that far. Yeah. Okay, La Sierra Acres says, have you experienced any behavioral issues with a particular color within the silver line? Never within the silver, but I had some, uh, I had some Italian sparkies I got, and I only kept the line for about six months. They were the meanest, roughest. Really, line of, I've never, I've never had a group of quail that mean. They picked hmm. all the feathers off. If you you couldn't put a, you couldn't introduce a new bird, they'd kill it, and they eventually kept killing everybody else in the pen. Right. So I said, no, I won't breed anything like that. Never okay. had a problem with the sober, but again, that's because I keep crossing my sobers oh, every five or six generations. Right. Uh, Henriette says, how pure do you think the genes of the Schofield Silver Collection are currently over the world? Not. Not? The soap, the, no. Uh, Robbie did a great job of separating them all, right? He, he purified the colors in the sobers before he sold them. But after seeing some of the colors I've seen, there are there are more variations of sober in the world, which probably all come from someplace, from the, the SSCs. They have to, mm -hmm. to get that gene. But there are breeders who breed five or six generations. If you find somebody who's gone five, six generations, you're probably going to get all sobers from their eggs. But even my birds, when Robbie, I forget how many colors. Well, we found that we're in my sobers really? when he started separating them all. The sober color is what identifies them, is having the sober gene. And basically, if it comes out sober, I call it an SSC now. Okay. Okay, uh, Klaus says... Go ahead, Perry, if you want to finish that sentence. I was just going to say that everybody is going to have to cross out the assumption. So if you really wanted to keep them... Sobers only, you could only ever cross them to the wild type. That gotcha. would keep your sober sobers. Okay. Uh, Klaus says, uh, how did you figure out the lethal gene and what did you do to breed it out? Could the lethal gene reappear once again after some generations? Yes, it can reappear. I had a problem with it when I went too far a couple of times. Uh, the lethal gene was deadly when I first got it. So what I did was in order to keep my flock going, I crossed out to Rosetta's one time and then the next time in two or three generations I'd cross out to the Tibetan line which was separate. Mm -hmm. I crossed out 
to the Goldens once. I didn't like the Golden Cross. That was the poorest cross. And it crossed out a couple of times to different feral lines. And I'd always breed the chicks back to keep the sober color going. And this, from all the crosses sort of the first five or six years, the deadly gene started to become less of a problem because it had more bloodlines mixed in. Mm-hmm. Now, if I've had no problem with less than six generations breeding sober to sober without crossing out. As soon as I cross that sixth generation, the seventh or the eighth generation, which I've done once or twice, mm-hmm. fertility dropped. I had more chicks start to de- die in the egg. Yeah. Really. But if you cut it off at five or six, I've, I never ever had a problem. I'm actually crossing my sobers right now with my fills to bring in to to make sure I don't have problems. And mm-hmm. I'm kind of working on the calico sobers too. I want to see what they do when I cross them out to the fill. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. But yeah, it can come back. Okay. Tim says, uh, how do you separate tricks of chicks of different blood at incubation and brooding? Do you use multiple incubators? Uh, I've always had some type of uh, sportsman in my hat and box. I divided it off into uh, little sections. Mm-hmm. So I marked the eggs. I, right now, if you looked in my incubator, the egg says B times S. So that's black times silvers. And then it's got B times P. When I candle those eggs, yeah, there's always eggs you toss out. I arrange the eggs for the colors I want to separate at the front of the tray. Mm-hmm. And then when they go in the brooder box, they go into their own separate little section. Celadon eggs, I always just clip that little toe a little bit on the hind left foot. Right. Right. So I always wanted to know what was celadon. Because a lot of people just want it. Even if a chick doesn't lay a blue egg, if you look at a bird that's been hatched from a celadon bird and break its egg, it will be blue inside. It will have a blue tint. As soon as you break that egg, you can say, oh, this has the celadon gene. Hmm. Even, it, it, yeah, if you cross, I, I do that when I cross out. Because when I cross out, I want to make sure the ones I'm breeding back for the celadon is carrying right. the gene. Gotcha. So if it doesn't show blue inside this normal, I don't use it when I breed back. Okay. Uh, La Sierra Acres says, uh, would you consider writing a guide to the silver collection? It would be awesome to have your story and your experiences in writing. I was going to mention that the last time you went live with us, Perry. My wife has been out to me to write a history of keeping coternics. I, I'd consider it. It wouldn't be long, like I said, but I'd consider it just doing it on Apple Books and giving it away for free. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I know. I, I'm a retired teacher. I ha- I'm not rich, but I have enough money. I'm happy. Sure. The quail are my toys. <laughs> Yep. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't have a <laughs> fancy race car or anything. Right. I spend money on my incubators. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Uh, Klaus wants to know, when you got your blacks, uh, were their eggs standard sizes? I found them pretty small, between 8 and 11 grams, almost like button quail eggs. Okay, uh, my eggs when I got them were standard uh, 10 to 11 grams maybe 12 grams, which is mm-hmm. what I call a standard quaternic eggs. Uh, the hens were, were standard size, like a standard quaternic. 300 is what we consider grams. Now, you can somebody can convert that for yourself. 300 right. is, a, a, is a jumble. The normal quaternic hens that I had before I started working on jumbles would be 180 to 220. They would produce a 9 to a 11, 12 ounce egg, about twice the size of a button egg, regularly. Okay. I actually made jumbles, or pretty well jumbles, before I even got eggs from James by selective mm-hmm. breeding. If you select your biggest birds and you select your bigger eggs, you can get up fairly close to that 300 gram mark. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Like my blacks now, in four generations, I've been selected, and I haven't put the jumbo genes. 
But I have black cans which are 280 and 300 grams, which is or this at the bottom or jumbo size okay. by selected breeding. But the, the fastest way to get jumbos is to find somebody who has a big, feral, wild type line and right. cross that blood in. I know my, my jumbos took a 100 gram jump when I got the, the trade I made was for jumbos and Texas A&Ms with Robbie. I got okay. his Texas A&Ms and his jumbo fill for the eggs I sent him. Gotcha. So that's what I wanted. He wanted the silver. And, and actually, he wanted his lines. Yeah, and, and a funny little story. He, I don't think he realized he was going to get the Celadon egg, but all my birds carried. So the first bird he had that hatched a blue egg, he called me up from Louisiana and talked <laughs> over 45 minutes. My wife said it's going to cost him a fortune because that was before the cheap on this. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, he was so excited when he got that first blue egg. Uh, I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, here's another question from Klaus. Um, Klaus is the guy, Perry, that uh, did the uh, live stream on the issues with the Celadons. Uh, but he says, as a breeder for decades, are you having Celadon issues? And what's your opinion on them? I love the Celadon. I love the egg. I like the clear blue eggs. I don't like the pale ones. I don't like the spotted ones. But my birds, ne I never have a line that produces 100% Celadon because I cross out every four or five generations. Okay. I think if you're keeping Celadons, you've got to realize that if you go to 100%, you're going to have some problems. If you do it because you like the egg color and you want to keep it going, Cross them out every four or five generations and work on them again. At four or five generations, you're going to get probably 50 to 60 percent of the cross will lay blue mm -hmm. eggs anyway, and you work from there. But like Cross said, if, if you keep going with them, you're going to have a problem. Yep. That's exactly what he had discovered and what he was saying on the live stream. So. Yeah, and that's exactly mm -hmm. what I found over the years. Yep. Uh, okay, Freedom Quail says, I had a gray hen and a feral roo throw a gray baby with yellow lines in her feathering. Have you seen certain varieties mixed together that causes a deadly gene? I never had a problem with the crosses because normally I did a cross because I was directed in the cross. I have heard, I never had a problem, I have heard that you can have problems with the Italian birds with, with uh, 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 a reduction if you breed them together too often with a gene that will reduce fertility and stuff. The only birds I ever had that problem with was with the sobers with if I went too many generations. But whoever you are, if you're breeding your birds, you've got to introduce new bloodlines at least every three or four years. Mm -hmm. In three years, you've probably gone five or six generations with your birds. Or you can, if, like me, I, when I used to hats. I used to hatch year round. I always had mm -hmm. Christmas babies. I was getting three <laughs> or four generations a year. If you do that every couple of years, you got to bring in new blood. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, Lauren says, "How do you handle shipping eggs given the cold and temp gold, the cold temps uh, that you get in winter? Any special concerns?" Yes, the post office up here because of COVID is not as re reliable. Uh, I generally, because of the cold, stop shipping the end of November and don't ship during December, January. I start shipping when February, our days they start to get warmer and they usually get warmer. I use foam shippers. Pack them up good in foam with a foam on the top bottom and wrap the box good. I've never had anybody come back and tell me my eggs were frozen. Mm -hmm. But that's when the post office was going good. I'm right. a little worried about starting this year because <laughs> I I mailed a little box with something for my son in Calgary. We're in the same province, 700 miles apart. I mailed a special delivery by Canada Post. Mailed it on December 28th. Now, it's supposed to be two to three days delivery. He got it uh, this week on January 15th. <laughs> Right on Plus time. Plus $16 <laughs> to mail a box four by four. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to try uh, it anyway. Right. 
Uh, Klaus has another question. He says uh, currently he has uh, uh, black cross with Pharaoh in the incubator. They are, are they extended brown with fee as we're all thinking? Uh, what would that generation, if bred together, create back, create blacks or just a percentage? It won't, in my opinion, if you bred them back together, you will not get 100% black. No. Uh, I expect 25 to see. I'm not sure how the black gene works. I'm, this is the first time I'm doing the same cross mm -hmm. I would expect that you might get a percentage of black in the first hatch. I'm not sure. Tell them to contact me in three or four weeks. And I'll tell them what I got. To <laughs> see what it is. There you go. But it's actually the same idea he has that I want right. to see what would happen. And I really want to, I'm really excited about seeing what happens with the sobers in the black. Okay. Uh, Maria says, what type of feeders and waterers do you use with the cages that you showed us today? Uh, my friend makes a, a feeder that hangs on the side of the cage. It's, he makes them out of um, four inch uh, white pipe. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see the little windows on the side? He's actually cut holes. So you can see how much feed's in it? So he can see when the feed goes down in the feeder? I'll be darn. Yeah, yeah you what's, can see what's the watering system? On the side of the cage. On the back of the cage, you can see the yellow water there is. Oh, yeah, I see it. They, we use uh, the uh, 3 8 in pipe. They call them on Amazon. They call them pigeon waterers. Now, we okay. tried five different types. Of water is, I do not like the little cup types that hang in mm -hmm. the cage. These waterers clip on the bat, and when they fill up, they go down. So we have a little two inch hole cut by the water in the bat. They can get the water that way. Doesn't take up space in the cage. The mm -hmm. birds never get wet from the water, which I found in the cups in the cage. Some of the birds would roost on the water. All right. Which made a mess, so I really <laughs> like them. Uh, let's see. Klaus says, uh, have you tried uh, to create new celadons with a celadon rooster and plain hens, uh, then their offspring cross back together or back to yes. the father? Uh, yes. If so, have you seen better results in terms of quality? Well, yes, because you're introducing new blood. Now, your, your percentage of chicks that will lay celadon legs is going to go now. You know, it, when, when you do that class, you bring in an unrelated bird that has no celadon gene, you're going to lose 50% of that gene, what you had. Okay. Now, what I find when you do a new class to a new line that doesn't have celadon, depending upon the parents. Now, if he's talking about parents where he's getting 60 or 70% blue eggs, I'm not sure what would happen. But with my line where I was getting maybe 20%, I would find that one out of every four or five hens would be a celadon producer. If you broke the eggs from all the other hens, they would all have blue on the inside of the egg. They all hmm. carried the gene, but they laid a normal egg. Gotcha. So I would take the blue egg layer and breed her back with a celadon male. And then I would take a different celadon male and breed to the biggest hints that laid eggs with blue inside. So the male carried the gene. So I would gotcha. get a little slightly higher percentage from the male bred back to his daughter. But I would also get a percentage with new blood still from the male bred to the, the crossles that didn't lay blue eggs. Okay. My, my whole idea was to keep the color going. I wasn't worried about 100%. I, I just right. like the blue eggs. Yep. Uh, again, I've seen, like I said, I've seen places online where you got trays with hundreds of cell down eggs. <laughs> Not one out of color. I'm wondering how much trouble they have. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Trucker Planet says, Mr. Perry, do you use coated wire in your cages? Yes, and I love it. Yep. Much easier to clean. Uh, yep. It seems to be easier on the bird's feet than the normal wire. I, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I, and like I said, I bought mine from Home Depot. 
Now, in Canada, they do not carry it in the stores. You have to order it from the online store. Okay. But I would, I'd highly recommend their half inch by inch brack coated wire. It's, it makes, it's stiff enough. It makes a very good cage. Coat it. It's easy to wash with the power washer. I just unhook yep. them, take them out and wash them, put them back in, put the quail in, keep yep. them clean. You know, they're not going to wash like my other wire cages used to. Yep. Okay, um, I'm skipping over some of these questions that were already asked. Uh, Mark from the Shell Farm, uh, he's in Connecticut. Uh, a lot of people look up to you uh, for what you've done in the quail world. Um, are there any breeders that you look up to? Yeah, uh, I like, uh, yard, how do you say this? I have a different accent, so words come out different. Yardley in... Uh, oh, Martin Yardley, yep. Yeah, Foster, you. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Me. Robbie Wissard. Robbie Wissard was probably my first hero because of the help he gave me in getting the new blood stem. Sure. Uh, there's a couple good uh, Essex quail in Canada. She, um, Nicole Winkle, she does. Oh, yeah, Nicole, yeah. Yep. Uh, BC, what's his name? There's a breeder in BC. Uh, he's, he does really good with his trail. I think he does a different job. Uh, Gabriel, uh, Stefan Gabriel, I believe is how you say it. He's okay. good. From what I've seen in Canada, Nicole and Gabriel, there's another breeder in Ottawa for the. She does really good, really good with her birds. I can't think of her names. I'm old enough now that I remember faces, but I have a terrible time with names. <laughs> I hear but you, Perry. I'm getting Ottawa, the same way. <laughs> Nicole and Stephen Gabriel. Probably in Canada, those are the three that I really I take notice of. There's a lot of good breeders coming. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you, yep. from 10 years ago, the, the number of quail breeders in Canada has probably multiplied by 20 since the internet come. And there's a lot of people that get into a year or two and then go, oh, what down, you notice that down there. Right. But Nicole is very good. Stephanie's very good. I think it's Yvonne, and I can't think of her last name in Ottawa. She really cares for her birds. Mm -hmm. I'd highly recommend those three. There's another guy in Newfoundland that seems to do a good job, and again, I can't think of his name off Okay. And then there's you and Foster and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm way down at the bottom of the list there, Perry. <laughs> no, I look I, up to I, all the guys that you mentioned. I, I look at what you do and how you treat your birds, and, and that's what I look for. And again, okay. you're not, it, it doesn't appear to me that you're old to make a fortune that you want to do a good job. And, yep. and I appreciate people that want to do good with them. Yep. Oh, well, appreciate that. Okay, Klaus wants to know, because you like the silvers, have you tried also other dilutes, such as Andalusian, Lavenders, or the Blues? Okay, over the years with silvers, because crossing back and forth, all of those colors that he's talking about, were, they were cleaned up in, by Robbie and taken out of my silvers. Those yeah. colors were all in the silver. They're all from the silver gene. Really? And over the years, I have probably got 10 different shades of silvers. Besides those, mm -hmm. I, I've had such silver that almost whites, and I had so, the, the nicest blue, gray. Uh, I've had them the color of your jacket. Really? Charcoal. <laughs> That's the charcoal. That's more the charcoal. It's slightly darker. Yep. I actually tried to make black before I got them from Foster's. I took the darkest charcoals I could get and mm -hmm. kept breathing back to the <clears throat> Tibetan. Over over a year and a half trying, I actually got three black chicks. <clears throat> None of them. I had a black chick that was totally black. There was not the legs, the beak. The skin was almost black. But it only lived a month, so I think trying to breed from the charcoal, and I probably brought back the deadly gene, and that's why it did. I was so happy when Foster got the brack because I've always wanted a brack right. one. Yep. Okay, Ava says, "Is it possible to have healthy celadons as long as you are mixing every once in a while? Uh, is that what the big breeders do, 
or how can they keep up their inventory? I have no idea what the big big dealers do. I'm a hobbyist. Mm. I never kept more than 15 or 20 Saladon hens at a time, but because I kept putting new bloods in, I never had a problem with Saladons, except the one time, two times I tried to make them 100%. Right. If, if you mix up the bloods, anytime you put new blood in, you're going to help your flock. So if you buy Saladons from somebody else, not your own line, and put into Saladons, I think it could only help them. You'd be keeping the blue gene. Okay. But if you're doing it yourself, no, you got to breed out occasionally. Right. Um, Henriette, she's the girl that's in Africa that said she had the uh, white eggs. Do you think she should hatch those white eggs to see what kind of color she gets? I would love to see. Uh, but her white eggs, I could actually broke them to make sure they're white inside. If they're not white inside, they're very, very pale. Mm -hmm. That was I've had so many people tell me that they have white eggs, and then when they when they break them, oh no, there's a blue tinge. Gotcha. And you can get celadon eggs. I have that are almost white. I actually had celadons one pin that were laying a cream egg, but inside had the blue tint. But they was they were not white, but they were a cream color on the outside. I've had celadon laid green eggs, almost yeah. green. But they're always blue inside with that blue tinge. Right. Okay. Uh, Donna says, I'll be getting uh, my female quail in March. I want to have them for a few months, then introduce them. Is this possible? And if so, when should I introduce them? I think you're talking about introducing the male to them. Uh, it works. Her biggest problem to watch out is if she has her females by herself, mm -hmm. there's going to be a boss in that pen, and you put a male in there that hasn't been used to him, that boss hen, if you're not careful, will very likely scalp him or kill him. Right. I find the hens are worse for that than the males, especially in the jumbo hens. You get a big jumbo hen that becomes the boss in a pen, Right. And you put a new bird in there, she can be nasty to them sometimes. Oh, yeah. I have I've had that happen. I use for that, but I got in trouble on the internet with it already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the wonderful internet. Um, Anita Garrett says, what weight eggs are the minimum you hatch? We only set 16 plus grams and have single yolk eggs at 19 grams. I generally hatch... Uh, I prefer 15 to 16. Mm -hmm. You have to watch that you don't get too big because I find when you get over 19 or 18, over 19, fertility doesn't, the egg those, eggs don't say the hatch is good. Mm -hmm. I find really good hatching in my eggs at the 15, 16, and 17 grams. Yeah. Once you get 19 in the bub with my birds I have, they don't hatch as good. Right. I well, I know that uh, the eggs from Anita, those are the best, I, I kid you not, uh, Perry, the best pharaohs that I've ever hatched out. They're the largest. They're uh, very docile. Um, I'm, I'm just loving them. So but she's, <laughs> very happy she selects her eggs, right? What's that? Yeah. I, I wish I could get some eggs from her. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're, they're amazing. It's so hard uh, to get new blood in Canada. Uh, JD says, uh, maybe I missed it, but how do you know if a male is celadon? <laughs> how do I know? He's hatched from a celadon egg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. I never that's, the, that. that's the only way you cannot tell by color. You cannot tell by looks. Right. And even then, there's a percentage in the first hats of celadons. I think there's a percentage of males that don't get the gene. Okay. So what I try to do is I try to get keep males that are only hats from a pen where I know the hens are laying blue eggs and the male I was hats from a blue egg. Right. I find those males do a better job from that hats will do a better do job of giving cell done eggs. Okay. It's, it's sort of like I breed wine dots and if you breed wine dots, the bird is and the comb is the comb is uh, dominant on wine mm -hmm. dots. However, that first generation cross only half of the males 
will carry the double gene for the, the cones. So yeah, I really. usually bring my males. I like to get them from a second cross, like the second year, and I keep those and mark them. And... Right. It seems okay. to work okay for me. Okay. Cool. All right. We are down to the bottom of our list on questions. Um, what I want to do is, uh, while we're waiting uh, to see if there's any more questions, I want to announce the winner of the Serio uh, Humidity Pump and give them that person time to chime in and let us know that they're there. Uh, the winner is Sunrise River Quail. So if you're in the house, Sunrise River Quail, uh, comment right now and let me know that uh, you are here and I will put you down for that. Um, and we'll go ahead and take a few more questions while we're waiting on Sunrise River Quail. And then I'll announce the winner of the hatching eggs and the $50 gift certificate. Uh, Kyle says, what's the best week to butcher eggs? A butcher quail, sorry. Butcher eggs. <laughs> I probably would say, I, I find your males will grow till eight or nine weeks. And your hens, my hens are big. They'll be jumbo size of eight weeks. Mm -hmm. But they usually grow for another two weeks. So if you're killing hens, I'd say 10 weeks. Males by seven or eight weeks are probably full size. Okay. That's my opinion only. Okay. Uh, Chuck is in the house. Uh, good evening, Chuck. Uh, Better Home uh, Better Homemaking Network says congrats to the winner. I am still waiting on the winner. So uh, what was the name of that farm again? Sunrise, I believe. Yeah, Sunrise. Sunrise, or yeah, Sunrise River Quail. If you are in the house, I need you to comment... Uh, and let us know that you're in here. Otherwise, I'm going to have to select another winner because you must be present to win that. But I am going to announce the winner of the uh, hatching eggs, and that is going to LaRonda Torreson. So, uh, LaRonda, I'm going to write you down for the eggs. Carrie? Yes. How many people, do you know how many people are from Canada? Um, I think there was at least four or five. Ah, Sunrise River Quail is in the house and says, heck yeah. Okay, so you are going to get the, uh, uh, what do they call that thing? The humidity pump. Uh, LaRonda Torreson is getting the 30 count of eggs. And... Nick Doro, if you are in the house, you're going to get a $50 gift certificate from Hatching Time. Okay, it looks like we're, we're frozen. I'm frozen, Terry. You're frozen now, too. It's probably the um, connection. You're not frozen on my end, so. Okay, I'm not frozen there. I'm fro no. You're frozen up here. <laughs> That's, <the laughs> That's okay. I would be, if I was up there, I would be freezing right now. I'm freezing down here. <laughs> Uh, Del Chuchu says, I know the crows from the male help females to develop faster. Any way to help the males develop faster? I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. <laughs> of course, I've never considered it. I've always had males and females in the same building side by side, so I probably right. wouldn't notice it. Yep. Uh, okay, Bubba says not frozen. So, okay, we are... Um, let me get to your, yeah, Sunrise River Quail, I already got you. Uh, you are going to get the pump. What I need you to do is to email me your shipping information. And the same goes for uh, uh, LaRonda and uh, Nick. Um, email me your shipping information to terry at caternixcorner.com. And I will make sure that uh, we get that stuff sent out this week. Um, LaRonda, your eggs will go out as soon as I forward that stuff to Michael. And Nick, make sure you include an email address uh, in yours so Hatching Time can send you the, uh, the gift certificate. So La Rochelle Farm says, thank you for the great information. Um, guys, I really appreciate everybody that stuck around tonight um, to hear what Perry had to say. Perry's al always a wealth of information, and I really appreciate him coming on the show. Um, 
I want to thank everybody in the chat room uh, for all the great questions. Congratulations to our winners. Um, thank you very much to our moderators, uh, Lauren and Henriette. You guys do an amazing job. Um, so yeah, Perry, if you've got any last words of wisdom you want to part on us before we go? <laughs> well, it's, the it's been a pleasure to be here. And uh, maybe at Cross is still on. Tell him in a couple of months to contract me. I'd like to see what his results are with the BRAC Cross. Okay. Uh, he did ask a question earlier, and I just saw it for a second. He wanted to know if you ever tried the Rue gene, like the Egyptians or... I have, but again... Uh, they came in eggs I had from uh, Foster. Uh -huh. It took two weeks for the eggs to get here when he mailed them. So I only got like one or two of each type. Gotcha. So I, it really wasn't feasible for me. The Bracks, I only got three chicks from the Bracks. From those three chicks, I got two hens and a male. Mm -hmm. All the Bracks in Canada, and I've sold a lot of eggs, have come from those Three birds. Right. <laughs> so that, that's why I'm doing the class to put new blood into the brack. Gotcha. But no, I, I, the Egyptians were okay. I, I, they just didn't turn me on. <laughs> uh, one last thing. Uh, Ava says, uh, please write a book, Perry, uh, but I would want it in print, not Apple books. <laughs> she wants something to hang on to. So, all well, right, guys. Um, we'll do. Thanks a lot, Terry. Absolutely. Guys, thanks again for joining us. Um, don't forget, next week, Tuesday, we're going to have uh, Naomi from Kansas City Quail Farm. She's got some really important announcements for you. And then the following week after that, um, Kenny Mitchell's coming back on. I love that guy. So um, so do I. <laughs> yeah, Kenny, Kenny's a great guy. So everybody, thank you very much. Perry, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you guys all next week. Okay, bye.